SEO experts and just amazing people in general to help you get a handle on your business, your life, your relationship and your health. Today we are talking about pushing people's buttons. How do you do that online in social media? And I'm not just talking about Facebook ads or Google ads or any of that jazz. I'm really talking about communication online. How does that get you the reaction, the engagement that you want when all you have is this screen? So join us at amathatgeek.com forward slash live right now. Be part of the conversation because we're about to get started. Not with this song. We're starting again. Here we go. Hold on a second. We are going to start again. Like Myron said, if anything can happen, it will happen. everyone to I'm that geek show hop on in I'm that geek that com forward slash live I know we have about 30 people reserve uh, who are SVP'd in LinkedIn we cannot stream to LinkedIn because LinkedIn changed their stuff so this is the place for you to hop on in be part of the conversation get your questions answered and today I have with me one of the guys that I actually stayed a full day to listen to because the beginning of the day was horrible and finally he came up and saved the day. Myron Atlas, how are you, Myron? I'm doing well, how are you? Doing fantastic. I'm so excited that we are getting to talk because what you were sharing that day just blew my mind, right? Like there's so many things that people, when they start online, just miss, right? We're yep. just going out there and going like, Bleh, buy my stuff. <laughs> and it that doesn't work, does it? No, it's so funny. We want to tell everyone our story. We want to give everyone the reasons why we did something and we forget that we're selfish and that people want to know, what are you going to do for me? And when we actually do that right and we have the right messaging, then we go from that used cars salesman slimy feeling to elevated and, you know, a, a cult like following. Yeah which is, you know, what everybody wants. So let me just give a little bit of a um, preview of like, why should people listen to you, right? <laughs> Aside from the fact that I'm saying that you're amazingly fantastic, um, you guys should also know that Myron is the architect behind some of the largest internet launches. He was doing $1.2 million in four days and creating recurring revenue streams of $100,000 a month. So if that's something that you aspire to, you should better come on in here and listen to this guy because he knows what he's talking about. So you, when you were sharing with me uh, how to approach people online, right? You're sharing that um, there's something called psychographics. Psychographical marketing. Let's talk about yeah. that. Well, I, I, the word scares people. So I want you to instead think of it as everyone has a giant red button in the middle of their chest. Mm -hmm. And if you hit that button and you hit that button enough times and you keep hitting that button until they can't take it anymore, they're going to do whatever they can to make sure that you can't hit that button, which means to actually solve their problem. Mm -hmm. And we go through life with these uh, emotional hot buttons that where people could say something or do something and we we trigger an emotional response, whether somebody gets angry, they get sad, they get depressed, and it's harnessing that response into the sales process. So, you know, one of the one of the hardest things when someone starts online, like you said at the beginning, it's kind of like, buy my shit, buy my shit, buy my shit, buy my mm -hmm. shit, right? And we don't do that when we go into networking events or live events or meeting people in person. We start with a conversation of like, hey, Myron, how are you? Uh, what do you do? Where do you live? How's life? Right? How yeah. do we do that stuff online? Because online, it's kind of like everybody feels like, what, what are you trying to sell me? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's where psychographical marketing comes in. So with all my clients, what I start with is what problems do you solve? And is it a problem that people are going to pay for uh, the solution? 
you know, at the end of the day, there's reasons why people buy. There's power, wealth, prestige, and there's other reasons why people buy, but there has to be the right scenario. People also buy for health, but typically they're over the age of 50. So they've lived their life destroying their health and now they're trying to buy it back. Mm -hmm. We also buy for security. Majority of people only buy for security if something has happened, such as a break-in or break-ins in the neighborhood or they move into a bad neighborhood. They don't typically buy security right off the bat unless they were raised and in, in those beliefs were instilled in them from the very beginning. Okay. And then the last one is an impulse buy where you just purchase it because you're next to the cash register and that Snickers looks good. Yeah. And so when, when we just start, when we're starting out, right? One of the challenges is how do we know our audience? And most people don't have a huge budget to just go out there and put $2,000 into Facebook ads and kind of figure out what's the hot button? What do I need to press? So uh, is there a way around that? Is there like there's an easy way to find that button? Right. So the three main emotional drivers are anger, fear, and disgust. If you think about all the things that you've done, why you've done them, you're either angry, you're afraid, or you're disgusted with either yourself or the other person. So if I know that I'm going to start with targeting one or all three of those emotions at the same time, now I know that I'm going to get someone to move. So how do I make them angry about the problem that they have that I solve? How do I do that? And that doesn't require a large budget. In fact, it's I run ads for three days at $5 a day. Spend about $45 testing three ads and I'm ready to go because it's having those other parts of the psychographics that really then makes that connection and brings the anger and fear and disgust and connects it over to that wealth, power, and prestige. And that that's this beautiful marriage where you're in the middle creating that solution for their problem. So you said something super interesting when uh, when we met. You said the ads are going to be around fear, disgust, and anger. But when they come to your page, that's where there's going to have hope and security and all that stuff. So let's talk about that a little bit. So I've been hitting that red button and I, I've got you all hot and bothered. If I keep that raw nerve in your mouth and I don't actually pull out the tooth, then you're going to pull out the tooth or you're going to find somebody else to pull out the tooth. So now that I've got it, now that I've got you hot and bothered and upset, I need to let you know that there is hope. There's light at the end of the tunnel. And the fact that I'm the person that can get you from where you are to where you want to go, that I need to provide that immediate relief and that immediate gratification to you. So that way you don't start searching anywhere else for it. So the, the plan is really irritate them with messages, right? And we're talking about only Facebook ads, right? So yep. in, in, your, in your communication, hopefully you're nicer. <laughs> but with, right? with Facebook ads and with Google ads, you irritate, you like pro, put salt on the wounds, right? Yeah, it's 100%. You just, you keep poking them and you let them know like, hey, what are you doing? What's going on? Are you going to deal with this problem? Do you want to live like this forever? Do you want to not actually you take care of your wife and kids? Do you want to be a good parent? Do you want to, you know, be able to go to college? Do you want to be able to travel the world? What are you doing? Why aren't you doing this? You know, if in religion, it's that religious guilt to, to be a good person and in society it's, or with spouses, it's to do better for them and for our kids or not disappoint our parents. We deal with these emotions our entire life. And when we start with marketing, everyone forgets what emotions are. They just think if I have a billboard big enough telling you that I have something for sale that you're going to buy. And I just need to put it on the moon and then the world will buy. You know, I think that's, that's a masculine work. issue, right? If I have a billboard big enough, that's probably a, I'll get all the girls. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so maybe, maybe we need to switch to like feminine a little bit. Um, <laughs> so I was interviewing uh, Philip Stutz. Do you, are you familiar with Philip Stutz? I believe so. And so he said that consumer report now during Corona, uh, during COVID changed the consumer behavior to move away from aspirations and luxury into um, serving others. How do I help others feeling safe and trust? And yeah. so how do you how do you use those messages along with, you know, poking and like pressing the button? 
make it so they don't feel safe and trusted. You know, right now, the reality of it is, is that the things that are selling extremely well are for security. So we're in a weird um, psychological torture experiment with the pandemic. Yeah. And it's not that it's not the quarantine or anything like that. It's this fear of an unknown thing. So I'm going to do everything to protect myself and my family from this foreign invader. Wow. Right. Wow. So medical supplies and all those kind of things, they just sell themselves. But if we're going to now take that to somewhere else, I'm currently in the process of raising money for a business venture. And the key thing that I'm talking with every investor that is able to make that connection in order to get them per to purchase, not purchase, but to invest is that the business is pandemic proof. Mm. And they go, well, what do you mean? I'm like, we're going into a restaurant, but what do you mean a restaurant? It's a ghost kitchen. How is this pandemic proof? Because it only requires two to three employees. And we've already been determined that they are essential employees. It's pandemic proof. Yeah. And because it's not going to have a lobby to, uh, to have clients come in and because it's just a ghost kitchen, now do you see how we become pandemic proof? And people went, sign me up where let's get the paperwork over, have our lawyers talk, let's do this. And I'm a, I've been able to raise a significant amount of money. In fact, the week that I've been doing it, I'm 90% um, to my goal. And so it, it creates this weird dichotomy between being able to use that trust security and protection and what people actually want. There's a lot of different ways you can use it. There's two examples. So can we, can we actually use, um, um, you know, a business as an example and kind of like say how we're going to promote that online in these times or in general, yep. right? Absolutely. Um, so let's take what I do, right? Marketing, engagement, mm -hmm. um, live streaming, audience building. How would you take like, hey, now you need to build, are you losing an audience for live events? Are you, uh, right? Is that kind of like the, your live event was canceled and you're out millions of dollars you know, how much further can you go? Here's a solution. Come to my site to see how we do that. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what my clients have been doing. That's exactly what I told them is to build loyalty through the virus. If people right now are going to be getting in a routine of consuming your information. So if you're not putting out content at a rate at which they are consuming it, then how do you expect them to be able to continue to follow you and li live and breathe and, and want you once the pandemic has ended? Wow. So if we do that, now we need to be constantly in their face aware of what's going on with solutions that are actively working for them. Now we can't try to sell them high-end programs because the reality of the situation is, is everyone's wealth is in a, a flux of some sort. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we need to make sure that we're being aware of it. So if we have a low end continuity program, that's anywhere from 20 to a hundred dollars a month, that's something that's palatable for people to do. Mm -hmm. Now we're building that trust through the loyalty because I mean that a uh, loyalty through the virus, because now when the pandemic ends and financial stability has returned, we already have the trust and authority now to make the connection between a large purchase. So it's doing things like what we're doing here, bringing audience awareness. Now we're doing more brand awareness because the cost for ads are so cheap. I'm paying less than a penny for YouTube ads. It's obnoxious at this point. <laughs> how much traffic we're driving at such cheap rates because everyone pulled and the backlash that people are getting for this, we're in it together is absolutely dramatic because we're not in this together. You're in a $20 million home. I'm, you know, I'm over on the beach. I've been going to the beach every day. People can't do that. But because of where I live, we can do social distancing and I can go to the beach. You're the lucky. entire pandemic. It's yeah. It's you and what's his name? Uh, was it Matt Damon? That was talking about how life is awesome in Ireland, right? He's like surrounded. And Colbert was like, dude, you're not supposed to tell that. Rich people are supposed to hide it for yourself. <laughs> You know, I, yeah. I'm a homebody. So for me, I travel so much. I've been home for three months straight. I'm like, this is the greatest thing ever. I don't need to wear pants. I get to work with my clients. I just wear a nice shirt. Like everything for me has been great. And it's, you can't communicate that because people are like, well, that's horrible. You know, I also, you know, happen to have gotten COVID. So it's, it, it's, you know, it's funny. I was very mild case. We survived. Everything's great. So my heart goes to the people out that have this, but it's also at the same time saying, 
This is means you can design the life that you want right. because of the emotions that you're using. So let's do this in a way that we can we can make that connection to people. And if we don't connect with them, then they're never going to purchase from us. So let's talk about connecting a little bit differently from YouTube ads, right? Because a lot of people, and myself included, you know, we start thinking about YouTube ads and we start going like, I need to record a bunch of videos. I need to test them. What if they don't like it? Where do I put it? Like there's a whole process right behind all that stuff. And Facebook ads the same. Yep. Even though Facebook is like, you know, I was off Facebook for years, right? With Google Plus. And I just came back, I think, in the last year when Google shut down. They nailed me to the pixel. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm like, darn it, now I'm actually buying from ads. And yeah. I'm like, okay, so, you know, they are super awesome. And uh, in a scary way kind of thing, right? Because you have this real scary. balance of... Uh, privacy and convenience like I want to know what I'm interested in that's out there but I don't want you to know anything about what I'm interested in yeah. <laughs> right and the people behind the ads are people like yourself who go there and go like "Ooh, what would someone like if I'd be interested in right right and so when you're starting to think about someone there's the whole avatar story yep. right um, what do you do what do people do when the avatar is wide right it's kind of like Anyone who wants to be a thought leader would be a fantastic person or anyone who is looking for visibility would be a fantastic person. Anyone who smokes would be a fantastic person. How do you find and craft that message to that specific audience when you don't know specifically, you know, they're fat coin, they live in Austin. Um, right. They're awesome. <laughs> so the first thing that we call that is it's called boiling the ocean. You can't boil the ocean in order to get the fish, right? It's just, oh, it's not, it's not possible. So if we're not boiling an ocean, that means that we need to become very specific, right? So not every, so we start with the simplest. Mm -hmm. Not everyone wants to be a thought leader. Right. Then we look at what problems does your product or service or you solve? Because not everyone has those problems. Then we take that another step further. Who are the people that we want to can work with another step who are the people that can afford this mm -hmm. right so when we start now making these jumps and these conclusions we realize that there comes to certain types of people and then the other thing is is we want to work with people that have similar personalities that we do we don't want to work with somebody that's abrasive and the whole time you're just like why am i with around you like what kind of person are you but there's also things that drive them right, right. so when you're talking about female entrepreneurs, there's a lot of traits that they share. Hmm. There's a lot of things that they have. So you look at what are those traits? They typically believe in health and wellness, feminism. They believe in um, the law of attraction and Esther Hicks. And the, the, you start seeing the activities that they're doing. And it's funny because when you look at how marketers classify and categorize people from the outside you're like how did you make that jump or how did you make that conclusion or this doesn't apply to me or that's wrong that's okay because out of a hundred percent of the pie i only want a 10 percent slice so that means if i am wrong for 90 percent of the people out there that are not in that psychographical um percentage that I'm targeting, that's okay. Because when I go to make my message, my message to that 10% of people is crystal clear. Mm. It's the emotional hot button provides the solution that's going to save them and actually gets them to purchase. So when it all comes together, it creates the best possible marketing program available. What's the, what's the time length? You said you were testing ads for like three days for five bucks. 10 days is the total time length. 10 days, $150. Really? Yeah. So I start with three ads at $5 a day for, like, three, for three days. <laughs> and then whatever ad had the highest click through rate, I then test that for seven days at $15 an hour, at $15 okay. a day. So between that, at the end of 10 days and $150, I'll know if I have a successful ad because I'm measuring my click through. Now that doesn't mean I have a successful campaign because now I need to see what traffic is being sent to the landing page and what the conversions are on the landing page. So now if I get the conversions on the landing page, I know that I have a successful campaign, but if my sales are not converting high, then I know my next issue is my product offering. 
So there's little indicators each step of the way on where there might be a problem. And then that way you can plug and play and solve that. Is there a tool that you use? I know there's uh, something called uh, Geru um, that allows you to map. I'll share it with you. It's pretty cool, but it allows you to map your funnel and play with the numbers. So you can actually plug in the numbers and it will be like, okay, so if now the ad is converting, now it's converting at 5%. If it converts at 7%, the fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's my calculator. I've been, you know, it's funny. I've been doing this for so long and I actually worked with someone uh, with a client yesterday because um, I have the notes still on my desk where we built out her budget for mm -hmm. she wanted to know what her marketing budget should be. And it was primarily what I, what I did was just the conversions, the percentages on the phone. Um, she knew that she closed 70% of her sales. Oh, wow. So then we backed it up that she needed to have 15 leads. So we figured a 15% conversion means that she needed to generate a hundred leads, you know, 15% conversion wow. into the landing page. So it basically went from what are your sales to your close rates, to your leads, to your landing page, and then that creates your budget. So with Facebook, it's typically we generate 25 cents per click. So 25 cents, we factored a $100 a week budget by working through and it gave us a little wiggle room in case things were a little bit higher or not from there. So for $400 um, a month, we, we were projecting her to be able to uh, charge, um, to not charge, sorry, to generate $250,000 in revenue with her new product based on the conversions. Now. These are all sound great theoretically, but I have a feeling that her 70% conversion is going to drop dramatically once she has cold ice traffic. cold traffic. Yeah. And so I have, a, it, what it did was it gave her an understanding of this is what we need to do. So if now this percentage changes, we need to move and increase and go from there. So I, I'm not, I've always just, on the fly with my phone. But you've been doing this for a while, right? Like most people, uh, when they need to, they don't even, we don't even know like what's a good conversion rate, right? So, right. So what's a good conversion rate? Well, it depends on your industry. There's yeah. a lot of different ones, um, but they pretty much top out at 1.1% for a click-through rate on a Facebook ad. Um, typically using psychographics, we average between three to 5% across oh. the board. Um, because they're highly targeted. So we might have one ad that's only going to a group of 5,000 people, but we're also running 50 to 100 ads because it's not about how much money you have it per day. It's the group that it's going to and how much are they clicking on it. And so we have these large budgets, but we're not spending a lot on ads per day just because it's hyper-focused and hyper-targeted. Then you have what your landing page conversions are and we see anywhere from 15 to 25%. So our standard is 18% conversion on a landing page. Anything below 18%, we immediately create a new landing page. We don't try to test it or change it. We just start over. From 18% to 25%, we start making incremental changes in order to increase that. And the highest we've been able to get to was around 36% with a mixture of cold and warm traffic. And that was for a free download on a social media calendar. So we were, we were quite happy for it. We had one time period for about six weeks where we were hovering around 55%, but once we extrapolated enough data, it settled out at 36%. And that's like your case study. How did we get 55%? Right. <laughs> and what we found was a ton of warm traffic. So it really, just, it really skewed the results. So once we had it and not running long enough, it became 36% um, with a, a strong majority of cold traffic where we had no idea who they were other than coming from our, um, our ads. So we, 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 we use those two as our conversions. And then we look out on the webinars or the sales process, we shoot for a eight to 15% conversion um, for the product as far as on a live webinar. If we're above 15%, we'll increase the price. Um, if we're below 8%, we create a new product offering. Oh, interesting. So, wow, that's really, so you're in, okay, so, so many questions. Um, so, what is your process? Do you have a process of like warming up people towards the ad and the opt-in since warm? 
Well, yes, everyone has a sales funnel that you um, that you work people through. Uh, the greatest thing that um, that that I've come up with is the Venturian funnel, which basically shows that it starts with trust, authority, and then purchase, mm -hmm. and then from purchase you have the deliverable, the um, upsell and then the retention. So when you look at somebody as not a one-off purchase, mm -hmm. but really what is the lifetime value of them, you can then start going into, do I want to have a lot of sales at a small amount or a small amount of sales at a large amount? And I've always been a quantity over quality. So right. that's why we increase the price over 15% to we get into that eight to 15% range because we're making the same amount, if not more money with less clients to focus on because we can then spend more of our time focusing on those few clients. So it always starts with what is your target um, revenue that you want to make because how you build a $10 million company is very different than how you build a $500,000 company. And it's not that you can't change at any point and hit those plateaus and level up, but you're looking at the psychology of the sales process and it's a different process from the marketing campaign to the sales cycle to how you actually service them. That's interesting. And so let's, uh, let's pivot a little bit for, um, um, messaging online, right? Like not just ads, but as you're creating content online to warm the audience, to build the authority and the trust, I'm assuming you're also playing on the emotional buttons, right? Oh. But your messages all the time. Uh, why not? Um, and then, but the messaging is a little different, right? You cannot have all your posts be like anger and fear and disgust, right? So how do you create those posts that attract and get the engagement without always going like, don't you hate those internet marketers? Right. Don't you well, you, you sympathize, right? So now it's identifying and sympathizing with what they're feeling and what they're going through. Like, is this a problem that you're having being able to generate traffic to your blog? I felt the exact same way. In fact, when I first started out with my blog, it was six months before I got a comment. And when I saw that notification, I almost broke my phone, slamming my button, my thumb onto that button to get it to open up. And then when it finally did pop up, it was some bot that made a comment that said, <laughs> right. like my YouTube video. And I was crushed because here I had been writing an article every day, recording a video, doing all the things that every internet marketer has ever told me to do from some fly-by-night company that said, oh yeah, we're gonna get thousands of people to your page every single day. And six months later, I get a bot comment that's just telling me to buy more socks. Like, what am I supposed to do? I did the exact same thing as you. And in fact, that's why I created my system. Go to www.buymystuff.com. So pause for a second. This is interesting because I, not all of your daily posts are going to be like that, right? This is fantastic, right. by the way. Right? So are you kind of like, uh, is it like the jab, 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 left, left hook? Give, 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 buy my stuff? <laughs> so there's a psychological term called gaslighting. Yeah. <laughs> Women are very familiar with this because yeah. men typically do it to women. And I know, I know, but you have to look at psychology as a whole, right? So if you're mean to someone all the time, <clears throat> you also have to be at a certain extent where you come in with the kindness. So you, it's, a, it's a weird connection between kind and, and, and back and forth. So we want to make sure that we say like, yes, the, our ads are very poignant. We're, we're upsetting people to a certain extent. The content that we're putting out is sympathizing and letting them know that you feel their pain, you with them, you're gonna help them, you're gonna solve that problem. Both end up with the same conclusion. It's just your approach and how you go about it. And that way you can appeal to the most amount of people on what is going to be their biggest psychological driver to your offer. So are you, um, what I'm asking is like, you know, you have, we have the daily uh, post, the regular one, look mm -hmm. at my lunch, <laughs> right? Here's my kid, I'm on the beach. Um, you, do you sprinkle those, uh, empathy posts? You don't even put, you don't talk about lunch at all. No, because nobody wants to know what you're eating unless you're a chef. <laughs> and it's like, if you're a mindset coach and you have a bad day, you can't post that you had a bad day. Cause you're Why? supposed to be the mindset coach, Why? but people feed <clears throat> off of drama. My, what my most liked posts and commented posts are, I had a problem with a client. 
I got COVID, things along those lines. Those are the, the posts and the pe- things that people want to interact with. So it's like a story, but you have to make sure when you're telling your story that there's a purpose. So if you're a mindset coach and you're having a bad day, what did you do to get yourself out of that bad day? And what was the big benefit that you got from it? Right. So why are you telling me this story to serve what purpose? How are you making that connection from like what everyone else has when they have a bad day to why would I buy your program if even you're having bad days? So as long as you're telling a story that's making that connection for them, then it makes sense. So I, I was talking about how I had a client issue. I ended up terminating the client. They were upset, but because they couldn't see why we weren't able to do what they paid us for in the way that they wanted us to, because when you keep asking for them to do information, it becomes very frustrating. Like your team got frustrated with me because I didn't send them over a video. (laughs) It's true. And we are changing our, you know, the way we interact with uh, guests because of you. So congratulations. (laughs) Because I just was like, I don't really want to record a video. Like it was, you know, it's just like, I really don't want to record a video at all. I had a giant beard and then I shaved and then I was like, oh, I don't have my beard. Now I feel naked. So I was like, I'm not recording a video. And I just ignored the request for videos. Yeah, I gave everything else, but I'm just not sending over a video. And then every time you got it and it's the same thing, right? So a different approach a different way. Like if you had said, look, we're going to have to reschedule and I'm going to frankly not let you uh, do X, Y, Z. You probably would have got a better response, but you're so nice and kind <laughs> that you didn't go on any of the other emotional aspects or, you know, so, those so you're kind of- saying basically we need, we did, we did not kill you with kindness. Kindness did not work in that. Way. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bummer. So before we go to um, audience questions, you have a system that you're giving away for pe- to people who don't know how to do content um, and you share with them a calendar and in the calendar you're actually you know when they when they install that that's on their calendar and every day it tells them what to do and it's yep. post like um, updates and trends and facts and figures and did you know just like hey this is what you're going to post about today when you're creating when the audience is creating this kind of post is it going to be in the same format of like um, did you know when I was using this tool, I got, you know, 10% more productivity. Here's the tool that I use. Or like, how do you sprinkle those empathy posts with this type of content that we need to put out there? So the biggest issue that I found when you tell people that they need to post something every single day is they have no idea what to post. Right. <laughs> so you, it's almost like if I give you a starting point, now all of a sudden you have something to move forward with. So if I tell you that you need to do a testimonial today of people highlighting how they've used your product or service to reach their goal that they want, I give you an idea and a starting point. You're gonna do one of two things. You're gonna say, great, and start implementing that. Or you're gonna say, nope, that's bad. I wanna do something different. But now we've created that different idea. So every time we do that, we create this daisy chain effect of allowing you to create new content. So when you do something before, now you can say, oh, I already did that. Let me do it this way or do it differently or something different. So each time what we're creating is We drive the point home. Now we can do something that can create a new point for them so they can keep moving forward. Got it. So if anyone wants that, um, how can we share that with them? So I'm I'm not sure how we we can share them. I can send a link. Give it to me and then guys, you'll find it here. I'm thatgeek.com forward slash live right next to this video. There's going to be a link. You can click on that and you can download that entire calendar. It's 365 days, right? Yeah, Um, it's always up. You can do it at one in the morning. You can do it right now. Uh, The faster you do it, the faster you get implemented. There's in fact even a training video on how to upload it into your calendar so you can get a reminder every single morning that says post on social media. Today's topic is, and we give out infographics and a whole bunch of different stuff because the goal is, is that the more you implement content, the more you're going to drive people to your offer, the more you're going to establish your trust and authority because people are going to see you when they have that problem and they do that Google or YouTube search, they're going to see your face. That's telling them, Hey, this is what we did. This is what our clients did. This is what you need to do. And that it starts with creating that daily content. So let's move to audience interaction. I'm going to unmute you. Um, tell me your name. What is your name? Jason. Hey, Jason, how are you? I'm doing good. Welcome. 
Good to see you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you had a question for um, Myron. What is it? Myron, long time no see. I know it's been forever. How are you, Jason? I'm <laughs> doing good. Hey, bud. Um, so I am launching a dead elimination program. I actually created it several years back. I just slapped a new coat of paint on it and uh, modulated it. But I'm getting ready to launch that probably on Monday. And so I'm going to be gearing that towards consumers. But I also thought that it's going to apply to business owners. And I think that will be more of the target market that I want to go after. So what would you recommend as far as an ad, whether it was on YouTube or Facebook, to really grab their attention and to get them to the page? Uh, I would go with sympathy and disgust. So we're all in, and not a we're all in this all together, but we've all been affected in different ways from COVID. In fact, some of us have been in debt for more, have been servicing debt and been in debt for so long that we forget what it's like to actually make money and enjoy it. We've seen big companies that are going under because the moment they don't have a customer, they can't support their debt, such as Hertz, such as Neiman Marcus, all these other companies that are filing for debt protection with bankruptcy, where you can do it now and survive better and become nimbler and faster using my proven debt reduction strategies. Okay. Now, when you're doing advertisements, what specifically for this, what type of imagery would you recommend? Is there anything that pops or comes to your mind? Yeah. So depending on what type of business owners you're going for. So I kind of categorize them into blue collar, white collar. And then from there, I would make that ad. If it was a white collar, it's a frustrated boss in an office with papers all around him. I would add, I, and Facebook, I very rarely use video. I primarily only use images. Um, in YouTube, I primarily use stock footage to convey the same message and whatnot. Um, so if it's a blue collar worker, it's a guy in his shop working that's frustrated that instead of doing what he's supposed to be doing, so instead of a plumber with a wrench, he's sitting at his workbench with bills and stuff around him. I'm trying to convey utter and the most frustration that somebody could ever have in that image because the ad I want to exacerbate their emotional understanding. And then when they go to the landing page, give them the solution. Okay. I appreciate that. Yeah. My pleasure. Um, and then we have a question from someone on Twitter. Charles is asking, uh, this is an interesting one. So he says, um, I have a question about advertising that has come to my attention over the course of the last year. The pairing of interracial coupling. I've noticed one standing out and I was wondering, would it be racist if I push it in my advertising? I want to reach as many potential customers as possible, but I don't want to alienate anyone. Right. So this is a weird dichotomy that we're in. So every platform is being on the utmost basis that they are being careful in order to make sure that there is no um, racial or discriminatory undertones in any of the marketing. In fact, Facebook makes you say that you're not doing anything that's considered a, a special clause or employment or education or housing when it comes to what you're advertising. So what you're saying is, is you, people want to be able to self-identify with the marketing that they're seeing, right? That's right, the way that right. we, the, the terminology that we use in the industry. So in that case is, is now it becomes about testing. You know who you're going to show the ad to. So now create the same ad with various different, um, uh, people Couples, being represented, people of color, uh, people in different scenarios, people, different relationships and different makeups. I mean, right now in the news, there's a famous YouTuber who's being um, uh, debated on because she adopted a child from China who ended up having brain damage and autistic oh, wow. after four years, gave them uh, up for adoption into another home. And so, right, you know, that's a different racially made up family. So there's a lot of different versions that you can go through and then look at them. What are the click through rates? What are the conversions? Changing the, the, the makeup of a family and showing it on there, I, I, whether it's LGBTQ whether, or plus, whether it is people of color, whether it's different ethnicities, what it all boils down to at the end of the day, Testing. the click-through rate. <laughs> the one that has the highest click-through rate 
is the one that I'm going to use because that's going to tell me that I'm, I'm getting the results that I want and I'm targeting the people that I want. So I don't care if it's a blue alien that gets you the best click through rate. What matters is, is how do you increase the click through rate? So if you change out the picture and that's what targets it better, then go from there. So what you're saying is fascinating to me because I haven't been able to get myself emotionally to the point where I don't care, where it's right. all a test, right? It's like, I don't care what happens. It's a test. I'm putting an image. I'm putting five bucks behind it. I'm putting a copy. If it doesn't convert, I'll just change it to something else. And there's no emotional attachment to that experience, experiment. It's just an experiment, right? Yep. Most of us become like, so like, my campaign failed. They didn't approve my ad, <laughs> <laughs> right? I suck at this. This is not happening. Um, so how do you get like, is that because that's what you do every day for other clients and you're like, oh, try this, try this, try this. We'll see what happens or. My ads get declined uh, 10 to 15 per day. Um, remember, it's an algorithm. Right. So I automatically appeal every single ad. And typically of the 15 that get uh, initially denied, I'll be able to get 12 to 13 approved on repeal. The th the three or you know two or three that aren't i typically understand why they weren't and i know i was intentionally pushing the envelope for it like, but at let's the see if the that day, works right but at the end of the day it's a game so you can't look at it as a failure if you're in the beginning of the game it's like if you were playing monopoly and you get sent to jail that all of a sudden i'm not playing monopoly anymore <laughs> No, it's intentionally designed that at some point in Monopoly, you are going to jail or somebody in the team is going to jail in Monopoly. Tell so, that to my kid, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> So when you look at it from that sense that you are playing a game and now it becomes not that you're winning one battle, but I need to win the overall war. Right. And then it becomes in perspective that, okay, one failed, great. The next one's not going to, but it's a game of odds. Marketing and relationships are the same thing we don't swear off the opposite uh, uh the potential for love because one person turned us down we just say i'll try the next one or the next one or the next one or no i tried her or him that was not good let's go to somewhere else so it, it's just a numbers game uh across the board it's which is very interesting right because when we're putting ourselves out there especially as um you know business owners sole business owners that's your baby and yeah. so when you start talking about your baby out there and people go like, your baby's ugly, um, you start going like, what? Yeah. Right. But that's the whole thing with psychographical marketing and your messaging and solving that selfish need. Um, you know, if you're not, if you're just talking about me, 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 nobody wants to hear about you. There's a time and a place for that. But the initial of when we have that first interaction, it is not about um you it's about what are you going to do for me and so as much as you know it is our baby and we want to take care of it we also have to you know help that baby grow up to go to college and if we keep <laughs> eating at every meal you're not going to be there in the college dorm trying to stick pizza in his throat that's true unless you're dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> but okay so let's let's switch a little bit we're talking ads are you focusing more on facebook ads google ads youtube ads you just said youtube is fantastic yeah. And no, I actually, I do a lot of different, uh, Reddit native ads, uh, such as to blue, uh, Tabula. Tabula, yeah. um, it's all about the numbers. So I'm willing to test. The only thing that I refuse to do is co-registration. That's when they sign up for somebody else's product. They can click your button and sign up for yours as well. It's a gigantic failure every single time. Uh, because it doesn't go to both places or why? No, it does, but they don't know who the heck you are. So when you get an, they get an email from you, they think that's just spam. Yeah, that's true. Um, so um, you know those apps, you, like Tabula is super everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you have Tabula and you have also Google Network. What do you call that? Distribution Network. Yeah, Audience Network. I do yeah. not do it on the Audience Network. Really? Why not? Because though there are pages that are designed for AdSense click funnels where their goal is to just get people to click on stuff like that. So there's too much, in my opinion, spam and fraud in that industry that, that mm -hmm. Google is doing 100% everything it can to remove. But I grew up in the beginning when AdSense first started. I created those AdSense farms uh, to generate revenue when I was in high school. 
I saw ever since then, it's just left a bad taste. I do the same thing with Facebook. I don't let Facebook put my ad anywhere that it wants. I don't let it put it in Messenger on the side. It's only in the newsfeed. If I'm creating an ad for Instagram, it's only on Instagram. If I'm creating it for the stories, it's only in the stories. I don't let them make those connections and just share it out all over the place. And is that because of the conversion, the way that the ads convert or because the way you want to appear to the user? messaging location it's just like real estate location 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 and then with marketing it's all about the message 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 so if it's in the wrong place in the wrong scenario and they hear the message it's not going to be to get the conversions that you want and between images and videos you said you don't put videos in facebook do you use them in instagram no not at all i barely do only images i know it's like everyone's like what do you mean facebook says that. i just just, I just like it works images. Yeah. Uh, and YouTube, do you do PowerPoints or do you do videos? Videos. Yeah, it, it, it's always videos, but I use stock footage. So one of the my most favorite things is um, I believe the company was named Resolve, where they created a generic um, marketing uh, campaign and a generic political candidate. Um, I mean, you're talking in the last five to eight years, and those videos were absolutely hilarious. So now I just like to put stock footage and have voiceovers. Yeah, I heard that word. I even hear that PowerPoint works. Uh, yeah, and then to like a super bland page with like nothing, right? And yep. the horrible images of like body fat and all the yep. stuff that you don't want, right? <laughs> <laughs> and here's how we can remove your body yep. fat in four easy ways. <laughs> yep, it's it's amazing. The it's it's all about that emotional driver, you know, um, it, it and how they 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 tie into that specific audience because you know ads that are not targeted towards you right. that they're just sharing it to everyone and anyone, and then you know the ads that are hyper targeted where you're like, okay, let's find out some more. So before I let uh, Matt jump in, uh, question: Do you think? I mean, these topics: fear, disgust, anger. Um, and the headlines, right? Like everybody's sharing the same headline formula, how to do X with it. Do you feel like we're becoming kind of like numb to it and doesn't affect us anymore because we've seen the same formula over and over again, same headline, same fear, same thing? Ad blindness is a real phenomenon that people talk about where um, if you see something repetitive and in the same exact spots that people all of a sudden no longer notice it and go from there. So yes, you have to do things different. You have to put your personality and make a stand that might upset some potential clients. And you have to just know that for the fact that they are not your potential client and the fact that they're upset and weeding themselves out at that part in the process is something that's good on an overall basis. Right. Cause they're not gonna take your money and do nothing with it. Right. Which is really interesting. Cause a lot of people are talking about like major, like I want to have a big email list. It doesn't matter if nobody buys. Right? <laughs> so it's like, it's not like, okay, you paid for them to be, uh, for Facebook, for them to click, to get into your email list. Now they're just sitting there collecting cyber dust and yep. they'll never take action. So it's like you're saying quality over quantity. When we did our launch to um, 13 years ago to the one point uh, for, to generate the 1.2 million, we had a list of 15,000 emails is what we started with. When we sent them 7,000 were delivered, hmm. 3,500 was the actual ones that we saw any sort of open rate or connection and the sales through there. So we had a list of 3,500 people that were highly responsive and made decisions. That's fantastic. Which is again, numbers, you know, there's vanity yeah. numbers and they're real numbers. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you're watching this and you're just at the beginning of starting your online marketing communication campaign ads, all that stuff, just keep that in mind, you know, vanity numbers, numbers are not always meaningful. It's better to have a hundred buyers than a million yeah. leads, <laughs> right? Um, so Matt, how are you? Good. How are you? Fantastic. Good to see you, buddy. Hi, Myron. Hi, how's it going? Fantastic. So I was watching earlier and then I kind of jumped on because I had a good question for you. Good. Oh, perfect. What is your thought about post click engagement stuff? Like after somebody's clicked and they go to the page, there's there's a few tactics people use like pre-cart pages for e-commerce or there's click to the reveal the price to get kind of make people engage with it or even like the JavaScript to load the pixel like after somebody's already been on the page for 20, 30 seconds or whatever amount you set it to. What are your thoughts on those? Uh, and, you know, have you tried any and got any of those things that work for you? So I did uh, eye tracking um, software and stuff like that. Uh, this was 
five to six years ago on those kind of things. And what we also measured was heart rate. And so what we found is, is that when you start introducing a lot of those things, such as exit pop-ups or anything like that, you just frustrate and upset people where that they, they, you've removed the emotional driver that you've made, the positive goodwill that you've bought for presenting the solution. And now you've introduced resentment towards what the product is, especially with price reveal or paywalls or um, subscribe to find out more information. We did a test where they couldn't, where they sent them to a landing page to download a free training report, but made it a pop-up for the video that said they had to enter their email address afterwards. We went from 21% conversion when we could play the video, which the video had nothing to do with the page. It looked like it did, and then it was just like a Caribbean vacation, like 100% nothing to do with it. When we when they could play the video, 21% conversion. When they couldn't play the video, 8% conversion. So we try to eliminate as many bottlenecks as humanly possible. We just have the Google Pixel load when they load the page. We know that there's blockers. I mean, I use a, a product called Piehole to add block from a DNS level, everything right. on all my computers. So we, we take the data with what we have to move forward and, and go from there. So we, we try not to do too many um, tricks and use more of the psychological components once they're there. Sorry. Good? Good. <laughs> yeah. So when you were talking about, and Eric, if you're here, if you want to ask a question, let me know. Um, Charles is asking, should we try to emulate big companies and what they push? So you see someone, you know. Amazon pushing something, you're like, oh, it works for them. Let me do the same thing. Is that a good tactic? So big companies have the ability to implement ad campaigns that are locally. So you don't, you know what the overall company is doing, but you don't know if that local campaign is working and what the conversion and the success rate is. Companies have failures all the time that they don't talk about. And at the end of the day, if you implement one of their strategies that you think is working and ends up not working, you're the one who is more than likely not able to, su to survive the financial risk that you use, which is why I don't typically do anything when it comes to brand awareness. Mm -hmm. I only focus on sales conversion and lead generation as far as tactics, because brand awareness for me is, is unless you have a five to $10 million budget that is just marketing, it's not really, um, it's not really a product or service that you're going to be able to do. Now there is an exception to that. That's local marketing in mid-sized to smaller towns because you can use that budget and make a very big presence known. But on a national level or a global level, it becomes very difficult. It's okay. And so um, when you are setting up your ad campaigns, and we're talking about that, we're talking a lot about the psychographic, right? Mm -hmm. Psychographic? Psychographic. Um, so we're trying to find out what are the buttons, what are the hot buttons. We don't have to know what the hot buttons are in advance. We can guess and then we can put an ad and then we test the ad and we find out we're right, we're wrong. If not, we're going to change that. Yep. Um, the budgets don't have to be huge. We can run $5 a day for like three days, see which one works, run that for another 10 days, see how that works and then put more money behind it. Um, and then just be consistent with the messaging, right? So you irritate with the ad, push the buttons, anger them, and then give them the hope with your landing page and the opt-in. So, and we're talking, we talked about the, uh, the conversion rates, right? 2% for the Facebook ads, uh, up to 30%, right? 30% on the opt-in page. Well, the, the click-through rate, the, and the average is 1%, 1 1.1%. Uh, Facebook has found the action that they will take on a page is about 9.1% conversion. That could be purchase, scheduling appointment, a lot of different things. What we have found is, is the 18 to 20, 25% range is what our conversion rate is on landing pages. And then after the landing page, you're not automatically sending them to a sale on their landing page, are you? Or are you automatically a sale or email and then try to sell through email? Email and then try to sell. So we never try to send them directly to a purchase page. And the reason being is, is if we didn't convince them to purchase at the first round, we've now building our email list and can then make other 
appeals to their sensibility and other arguments on why they need it afterwards. And so now we have a follow-up campaign that will allow us to increase the conversion rate. Gotcha. So what's the conversion rate that you're seeing in an email? Most click-throughs, I believe, is about 3%, right? That's like the average? Yeah. So for us, we, we look at a product that we want to hit the 18 to 15% conversion for people that land on the page that actually purchase. If it's above 15%, we will increase the price of the product. If it is below 8%, we'll create a new offer. Gotcha. And that's directly from email. So we got right. the well, that's, that's anyone who goes to that landing page. We don't we don't separate whether it's email directly the opt in. We just look at it as what the percentage rate is on the product as a whole. Got it. And then if it doesn't, we change the product, we change the ad, we're all stuff. Sure. Um, fantastic. And then and, and so one of the and, and let me sum it up. This is all about emotional buttons, right? We're not appealing to their logic. We're not trying to give them stats or facts or like, this is why you should do it because this doctor, right? It's all like emotionally, I want to connect with you, irritate you and get you to buy. Yeah, I might make a, a reference to a stat or a study or a scenario, but it's more so because I'm telling the story and I'm making the connection with that person on why they need to take the action that I want them to take. Everything in marketing is about getting you to take a specific action in a specific sequence that is ultimately leading to a sale. That's fantastic. And so, and we talked about like, how would you do posts that are not necessarily ads? Would you boost a post like that? Would you just... Um... So I have done split testing when it comes to boosting a post versus doing an ad. And it, it so it, it outperforms doing the ad, which is the exact same way, basically a post, uh, a boost outperforms it dramatically. So I would highly recommend that nobody ever boosts a post and always goes in through the business manager, ad manager and creates the ad directly through there. And so in the ad manager, those who don't know, you can actually choose the post that you want to create as an ad. So rather than going into your page, clicking boost post, you'll take that post, choose it in the ad manager and put money behind that one, right? And so that will- yeah, Now you're really able to get that granular target. It gives you a lot more options and things that you can do. Fantastic. And so let's get Eric in here. Eric, how are you? How you doing, Eva? What's going on? Good, so happy to see you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. You got me in the office today. I'm not out, you know, in my, my normal, you know, sunny background. This is me hanging out in here, just getting stuff done today, so. Awesome, so right. question for uh, Myron. Hey Myron, how you doing, bud? What's going on? Good, how are you, Eric? Good, good, listen, quick question. And I, and I came on late, so I missed some of the stuff about agitating them. So I'm gonna go back and re-listen because I'm really interested in hearing that. We have an ad running now for something that we're doing uh, we just turned it evergreen. The ads have been doing really, really well. We're, we're converting uh, their Facebook ads. We're converting at just over 2%. And it's a free offer for the, on the landing page. And it's we're getting about 43 to 45% conversion on that, which is great. Oh, it's phenomenal. And I heard you saying something about don't you know sell them or if they don't buy. We give them a, a one-time offer. Once they land, if they take it, great. If they don't, we do, you know, have an email thing in there. Um, the conversion rate on that was really good. It's fallen off. And now we're going to be doing some stuff on the sales page. But I wanted to get your feeling on when I heard you say, don't sell them anything from the landing page. Does that include one-time offers and things like we're doing? Or you mean or just so I'm on the same page with you. They go, they're going from the Facebook ad, they're giving you their email address and then you're making the offer. Yeah. So in other words, once they put their email address in and, and register, um, we, you know, we say, thanks for registering. Now we have an offer for you to upgrade uh, one time offer to upgrade at a certain price at a, at a discounted price. And they can either, you know, X out of that or take the offer. If they X out of it, they'll get the offer again during um, the campaign. But um, so my question to you was um, when you said no selling from the landing page, is that what you were talking about? Are you seeing higher conversions, just giving them the freebie first and then going in later and trying to upsell them or? No. I, so what I, what I meant was sending them directly to an offer page. So what you're doing is exactly what we do. We okay. have them opt in, we drive them to an offer and then we create multiple offers from there. 
So if your offer is at this point falling off, then I'm, I'm thinking more so along the lines of has public opinion or the industry shifted in such a way, or have you have you reached terminal you know terminal velocity with that type of offer? And should there be some changes that could be made to it that are very minor? not pricing wise, but that could then increase the conversions. Is it graphics? Is it layout? Is it offer? So I would go, honestly, when I have situations like that, where I start to see a dive in um, conversions from that point, I start looking at the page and what changes I can make from there. Yeah. Okay, great. That's what we're going to do. That's the plan for this week is I know there's some weaknesses on the sales page. Um, Do you have a video on the sales page? Uh, no, that would be the first uh, thing video would... on the landing page There's a video on the landing page. So the first thing I would do is a video on the sales page. Okay. And see if, and see, and then run um, at least a hundred to 200 people through that offer before mm-hmm. I made any other changes, just so then I could measure what the conversions are from there. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. I kind of like that. So in other words, like a video, the one that's on the landing page now is kind of like a trailer teaser. Mm-hmm. And what they're going to get. And I'm feeling on the sales page, maybe something from me that, you know, says, hey, thanks for signing up. And now I have this for you. And here's why it's valuable, that kind of thing. I wouldn't even mention the sign up unless you're going to say they're getting an email for what. Listen, you're going to get an email here in the next 15 minutes. It's going to give you a download link from there. But what I really want to talk to you is, is for those of you who, because you took that step mm-hmm. and you had such trust in me, I want to present to you where we can actually dive in deeper and, and not say that you're presenting a special offer, but you're making the yeah, connection sure. to them more on an emotional level. All right, great, man. I love that. I think yeah. we're going to do that. So that, that's, a good, that's a good start. I really appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. Yay. So uh, thank you. I yeah. know this was kind of like a uh, fire hose kind of thing in your <laughs> face last minute, but fantastic having you here. Um, guys, if you want to get in touch with Myron, Myron, how did he get in touch with you? So you can go to myronalice.com and uh, from there you can download the social media calendar. You can find me on every social media platform known to man. And what I do is I constantly answer questions. I love when people post things on my wall asking questions. Um, I don't, I'm not, I do respond to private messages as well, but I prefer on the wall because that way everyone can learn. I believe in uh, the, the learning and doing in public. So it, it really gives you an opportunity for us all to connect. So Myron Alice with an A.com. And if you guys want uh, the calendar, the content calendar, right here, amazongeek.com forward slash live to the right of the video, you'll see a link that allows you to uh, download Myron's calendar. You're having uh, Von Sane from Twitter says, uh, this is what having a nose for sales mean. <laughs> <laughs> on the fly, you're pulling out, this is the campaign, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so guys, take him up on that offer. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It has and, been an absolute um, pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It's so nice to see you. Like, I, like, I feel bad. Like, I can't give you a hug, but I just want to be like, Aah. I know, COVID. Let's do COVID. <laughs> <laughs> and um, thank you guys for joining us. We will see you again in another episode of I'm That Geek in about two weeks. <laughs>